Wyman. These slides are available if you want to follow along and there are some like clicking links and this is kind of a nice resource to be able to refer back to um, if there's anything <coughs> that you forget about and don't want to take notes or why not. So the slides are at slides.lucywyman.me slash Linux jargon. Um, I think this is probably linked from my like Linux Fest Northwest talk page thing hopefully. Um, but if not, there it is. I'll leave it up for a sec. Although it's been up, I guess, for like five minutes, so we're probably good. All right, I see pencils have stopped. Move on. All right, so who am I? My name, like I said, is Lucy Wyman. Um, I work for a company called Puppet, which does a thing called configuration management. Um, and specifically, I work on a project called Bolt, which is basically our Ansible compete. It's an like, ad hoc task runner command line tool thing. Um, it's pretty fun to work on, um, but yeah, <laughs> basically do that all day. Um, so the first word that I wanted to define in my Linux jargon talk is to talk about the word hacker, because I think that this word gets a really bad rap and has a lot of negative connotations when it doesn't really need to be mired in such negativity. So the definition that I found for a hacker that I like the most, which is actually from Wikipedia, is a human who engages in activities such as programming or any other form of media uh, in a spirit of fun and playfulness. Um, and I really like this definition of hacker because I like the idea that as programmers we are doing what we do not just to because it's our day job or to make money or whatnot, but because we really enjoy it and out of a sense of like yeah, joy and playfulness and exploration. So I hope that this talk uh, kind of gives that to you is, uh, that's what you get out of this talk is that sense of like fun that can be part of programming. Um, find the hacker in all of us, you know, that kind of thing. Okay, so the first like category of words that I wanna talk about are conversational acronyms. These are the kind of things that you probably see in like your Slack channel or your emails or in like more social conversations with people in the technology community and you might not know what they mean. So here are some of the common ones that I've seen. Um, A-F-A-I-K, um, at first I thought this meant like fake or something, um, but it does not mean that. It means as far as I know. Um, AFK, which uh, often looks like a fake, uh, means away from keyboard. Um, I'm going AFK kind of thing. The BDFL is the Benevolent Dictator for Life. Originally, I think Linus was the first Benevolent Dictator for Life, but now there's like several, like the person who made Python and the person who made Perl. Um, have like claimed the title, so now there's like 12 benevolent dictators mm -hmm. for life or something, and the title has lost a lot of meaning. Um, the bastard operator from hell, mm -hmm. this is that really, really grumpy tech person that might work at your office, um, that is just always dealing with people who are very frustrated, and therefore they are very frustrated um, and grouchy. Um, and there's kind of a manifesto called The Bastard Operator from Hell that uh, tells a tale about one such person that is a hilarious read and kind of part of the technical zeitgeist, if you will. Um, IIRC does not stand for the Apple version of IRC, <laughs> as I initially expected. It stands for, if I recall correctly, or if I remember correctly. Um, I am HO is in my humble opinion, um, and sometimes people will drop the humble, so I am O. This has entered more of the like social, like my mom will use this sometimes, um, but it again was something that I had to look up on Urban Dictionary when I first saw it. So I'm saving you that Google. Um, IRC stands for Internet Relay Chat. How many people use IRC or on IRC? Nice, yes, that's the thing I love about Linux Test Northwest. It's like, yes, people still using IRC. Um, so yeah, uh, IRC is like the original Slack kind of thing for um, those who are not familiar. It's just a uh, messaging client that people can use. Um, TLA is three letter acronym. Again, that's probably left the like technology community for the broader community, but still commonly used. 
And then YMMB is your mileage may vary. Um, okay, so now we'll get into more technical acronyms. So these are words that um, hopefully are like a little more intermediate level of technology. And um, I assume that everyone here will know at least one of these, but I'm hoping that everyone here will also not know at least one of these. So apologies for the redundancies for your current knowledge, but also yay for the holes in your current knowledge. Okay. Uh, so the first is the application programming interface, and it's taken me a really long time to understand what these are exactly. Uh, I feel like the name doesn't really describe what they are very well, and so uh, like understanding now, it is yes, technically an interface between uh, a program and various applications, but the way that I think of it is that it's an agreement between two programs for how they'll talk to each other. So basically it's usually like a set of endpoints where there's something that uh, like receives requests on those endpoints and then responds accordingly. Uh, it's like the typical kind of back and forth with an API. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a contract between two applications, essentially, a way for them to talk to each other. Um, the Berkeley software distribution was one of the very first uh, Unix operating system distributions that was created in Berkeley in, I want to say, 1970, 74. Um, and so it was one of the like super early days open source operating systems that was like very fundamental and key to the like development of Linux and open source operating systems. Um, and also their like widespread use outside of just the academic community and starting to be used for actual purposes. Um, CLI is command line interface, so that is the uh, black box that you will see Mr. Robot typing into frequently. Um, this is basically how we interface with our computer, right? Um, I assume pretty much everyone uses a command line. Yeah, I'm seeing the odds. Okay, cool. Um, DDoS, or denial of service attack, so this is the type of attack where a uh, denial of service attack is where you're trying to, like, quote, take down a certain service or usually we refer to websites, but it can be any um, service that people are providing. And the distributed part of this is that you are trying to deny that service or take it down by uh, overwhelming it with requests, so kind of a stampeding herd situation where you just completely overwhelm the resources available for providing this service um, and take down the servers that way. These still happen, like everyone probably remembers when the IoT bots took down, um, yeah, <clears throat> and uh, so like even nowadays, like there are many ways to go about like avoiding this. You can ban things that make multiple requests or s try to slow down um, pe like things that are making requests, <coughs> but uh, DDoSes do still happen. Um, DHCP is the Dynamic Host Control Protocol, so this is how your laptop gets assigned an IP when it is not actually a like static computer that is always plugged into the same internet. Um, so yeah, that's the dynamic part of the host control protocol. Yeah, how your computer gets assigned an IP. Um, DNS is the domain name system. So uh, this is how your URL gets resolved to an actual server. It's basically like the phone book you could think of uh, for um, computers or the internet. Um, Emacs is the editing macros. Uh, this is a tool for editing, uh, I want to say text, but it's mostly for like programming and coding. And this was kind of before the time of um, 
what are they called? Development environments? IDEs. IDEs. Yeah. That was integrated development environments. So this is kind of before that when you were editing files, usually on like either remote systems or uh, locally, but without the abilities of an ID. Oh, a person left. That feels bad. <laughs> <laughs> I still use it. Yeah, yeah, I, I still use Vim, so. <laughs> um, yeah, and I, I do often find my, because you'll often find yourself, right, like on remote systems, which obviously don't have an ID, and you don't want to like hook up a GUI to like a remote desktop to this remote system, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so yeah, Emacs and Vim are still widely used um, just as text editors. I think they're also pretty robust and um, there's a very strong community around both text editors, which means that there's a lot of resources for learning them, for answering questions, which is also true of IDEs. Um, yeah, I won't get too deep into the ID versus text editor <laughs> debate um, because, yeah. I ultimately my answer is use what you know. Don't bother learning new things ever, really. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, end of file line day message. I think this is all of the end ofs. But um, going on, FIFO is first in first out, and so this is a type of queue. I think it's just a type of queue yeah. thing, yeah. Um, and so there's a couple of other like uh, queuing methods. So uh, first in, last out is another one, philo. But it just means that uh, when you are reading from a queue, the first thing in will be the first thing that you read out instead of the last thing in so being the stack. first thing yes. you read out. Philo yeah, exactly. Stack. Um, and this is also kind of applicable with things like grocery shopping lines, mm -hmm. right? Or like when you get on the ferry, the first one in is the first one out. I heard this recently in a conversation about how there are these cars where, um, I forget which company it is, but if it detects that it's moving and there's no driver in it, then it thinks it's being stolen. And so someone drove one onto the ferry and it started moving and it wasn't like turned on or being driven and so it like locks up and then they couldn't get it off of the ferry and <laughs> it was the first one in <laughs> so this became a problem anyway that's fifos um fix me and to do these are ways of like highlighting in code and most text editors will like highlight them and then you can have like a git plug that is like, hey, you still have some to-dos, or like various linters will catch them, etc. Um, GCC is the GNU compiler collection, and so this is used to compile, I think, a variety of languages, although I've only ever used it to compile C and C++ flavored things. Um, but yeah, this is the like original, again, kind of the OG uh, C compiler. Yes? Uh, on Mint. I gather GCC means the uh, GNU C compiler. Oh. So 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 they you know for for some reason you have to pull G plus plus separately. Oh. So hmm. there's that. That is a thing. Yeah. Cool. I did not know that. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of <laughs> compilers in you probably don't want like Java or Ada. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and then GNU is a um, recursive acronym, so it stands for GNU's not Unix. Um, GUI is graphical user interface, so basically, uh, like even your terminal is like a graphical user interface. It is things you lay your eyes on and can interact with. Um, Intercal, this is just amusing. Intercal is the compiler language with no pronounceable acronym. Um, <laughs> So it's a language, I will, if I recall correctly, it's a language for writing compilers um, that they did not create a pronounceable acronym for. Um, ISP is Internet Service Provider. This is another one that I was too embarrassed to ask about for a very long time and was very confused in many conversations about. Um, so yeah, it's Internet Service Provider. You are welcome. <laughs> um, 
This is one that I heard a lot more in school when I was doing more systems programming, and I have not heard it really since then. But um, IPS is instructions per second, so usually this is in reference to um, CPUs and how quickly they can do various things. Uh, message of the day is OOTD. Read the cussing <laughs> manual. Um, and this is, I believe, an amusing graphic, actually, which I will bring up. Read the friendly manual. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I saw this on a t-shirt in uh, that TV show, The IT Crowd, and <laughs> thought it was amusing. <laughs> of, uh, yeah, I, don't, I won't get into the little red book. But, um, oh, that is not There's what I meant also a book entitled RTFM. Is there really? Uh, with respect to hacking, it means uh, red team field manual, <laughs> which I perceive to be something of a double entendre. Mm -hmm. Is it good? Have you read it? Yeah, it's just a little handbook. There, it's in. Uh, there's a blue team field manual also. Mm. It's basically a compilation of different uh, commands that, that hackers typically use. Mm. Sounds interesting. Um, TTY stands for teletype terminal. So this refers to way back in the old days uh, when you would have a like physical monitor, a teletype a terminal that was like like those old TV screens basically. Um, with like the cathode rays and everything. It's an actual teletype. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and you would, uh, yeah, plug it into your various machines and type away. And we still kind of use this to refer to terminals, despite the fact that they are, I don't think really <clears throat> teletype. That's a great test question. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, Vi is Vi improved. Uh, so Vi, I think, is visual something. And then Vim is Vi improved, the superior text editor to Emacs. <laughs> <laughs> yes? If one is really better than the other, why do so many people end up using them both with evil mode in Emacs? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or Space Max now. Mm -hmm. um, I think that it's just whichever one you learn is the one you use. And I've heard, too, that it's a little bit of a Vim is West Coast, Emacs is more East Coast, although I think that that's kind of dissipating. Um, I don't actually think, uh, honestly, if you wanted to debate about it, I do think Emacs is <laughs> the at least more featureful text editor. Um, but yeah, there's still a bunch of buddy duddies like me that learned Vim first and don't want to take the time to learn Emacs or Space Max or Emacs in evil mode. So. Yeah, 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 I think I think Vim's much faster, but mm -hmm. but Emacs is, is way more encompassing and you can you can automate things to a huge degree. Mm -hmm. It's an operating system. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, and I, I think it's uh, yeah more powerful in many ways than Vim, but. Uh, Back in the day. Yeah. <laughs> I remember using VI a little bit, you know, no M. Uh huh. And you know, kind of, kind of the uh, um, thing was, okay, VI was more powerful, but the learning curve was steeper. Mm. I think you mean Emacs. Mm -hmm. No, back in those days, really, VI, you, you you didn't have any, you know, graphical stuff. It was all terminal. Mm -hmm. And so, so, so you had to know everything. Mm. But once you knew everything, you could do anything. Mm -hmm. Emacs was more graphical, but you know less powerful mm. in those days. Well, mm. well, well, they had text versions of Emacs too. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah. They, yeah, they, yeah they, which, which I think was always more powerful than VI. Oh, okay. Hmm. Emacs came before VI, so. Mm -hmm. Oh. How many years does it predate it? It's probably been five to ten years. Well, it ran back before Unix was existed. Hmm. Language mm -hmm. was developed in the late fifties, early sixties. Mm -hmm. um, VI is a visual replacement for Ed, the command line editor, mm. which sent single line text instructions for editing text documents before there was any kind of large type editor in Unix. Hmm. Very cool. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Yeah, neat. I did not realize that Emacs was that much older than VI. I thought that they were relatively, um, developed relatively closely together. Well, Vim isn't even a direct descendant of VI. It's a descendant of a uh, fork of VI for uh, some Acorn machine. I can't remember. <laughs> there was a port of it. Uh, but today, most of the Vim code base comes from like another system port that just was ported back to Unix in the 90s. Hmm. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I had no idea. And Emacs has a Lisp interpreter in it. Yes, so, that I knew. Yeah. <laughs> I know. everyone. So I have been writing a lot of Clojure lately, and everyone says that I should use Emacs, and I, I'm still really... <laughs> <laughs> Emacs was actually based on another editor that everybody thought was Tico. Tico? Tico. Oh, T-E-C-O? I feel like right. in my very distant memory I've heard of that. Macros from Tico, that's why it's called Emacs. Mm. Very interesting. Well, I should probably not be giving this talk. Sounds like <laughs> 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 if you weren't, we wouldn't have learned all this cool stuff. <laughs> no, yeah. Um, but yeah, cool. It's the knowledge of the commons. Um, yeah, we'll go on. Um, WYSIWYG is what you see is what you get. So this is usually like those boxes. Um, in, I know the first one I used was in Drupal, I think, um, or like WordPress, or now I think Git probably has one, where um, you format your text sp in your own specific way, and then what you see is how it will be rendered, ultimately. Yeah, it seems like that was popularized when, when Macintosh first came out. Mm. <clears throat> that was the big claim in the Macintosh. There were those who claimed that you should pronounce it wishy-wig. Wish because you're just wishing that it would come out. <laughs> <laughs> it would ultimately be rendered. That's funny. Yeah, there's. Oh, those are so frustrating. Honestly, yeah. <laughs> I remember um, back in the mid '90s, that was a big selling point. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. That it's one of the bullet points to try and convince you to buy their machine. Totally. <clears throat> well, and as non-tech, like when I was first starting out, it wasn't very technical. It was like a big. If the management system we were using um, had a WYSIWYG, that was like really nice, because then we wouldn't have to like write Markdown or anything. But um, Yaour is the uh, command line tool for Pacman, which is the Arch Linux package manager. It stands for yet another <laughs> user repository tool, and it also means yogurt in French. <laughs> Unrelated. Um, that was just a fun one. Okay, um, moving on to security acronyms. So security, like this slide could be its own complete talk. Um, but again, hopefully most of these, most people will have heard of. Um, but yes, there are many security acronyms. One is PGP or pretty good privacy. So this is a um, I think protocol is probably the right word, or like a set of steps to follow for encrypting data. Um, yeah, as it says, it's a data encryption standard, which then there are programs that implement PGP, um, such as the GPG, the GNU Privacy Guard. So this is um, a commonly used open source implementation of the uh, PGP standard. Um, where you can create your GPG key and then people can verify that you are who you say you are and you can sign things with your GPG key which proves that you are the person who created that thing um, and everyone who trusts you can verify that it was you that actually did the thing so for example you can now sign your git commits with your GPG key and this is a way to verify that it was actually your account that made that commit, etc. cetera. Um, another key system is called RSA. I assume most people have RSA keys. Um, so RSA is named after three really smart dudes who made uh, probably the most widely used uh, public key cryptography system today. I, I feel like that's... Um, 
I feel confident in that statement, so I'm going to say it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, RSA is also the company that um, for 10 to 15 million dollars, um, the money from the uh, NSA, they used a, a, weak, a weak default encryption for one of the you know, for, for one of the encryption programs. Did they really? Yeah. I came out with the Edward Snowden. Was that early days or recently? No, this is like five years ago. Dang. Um, I know that the NSA had, like I was reading about backdoors earlier today and read about the um, technical, I forget what it was called, TAO backdoor that the NSA had, but I did not hear about that. Yeah, at least that one was just to do with RSA as a company in which the elliptic, cur elliptic curves they were including. Um, as a default. Yeah, but in terms of like OpenSSH's implementation, it's not really that good. Mm. It's just what they decided to use for their product. I see. Okay. So what what is RSA the company then? Uh, they, they make some security products like a, a Windows SSH client called SecureCRT. Okay. Yeah which no one's ever heard of or cares about. I was going to say, is that like <laughs> secretly with, is that one of those things where it's like you're using it and you don't know it, or is it actually like no one's using it? I, I, inside businesses, I think people use it. Okay. Does RSA, the company, also stand for Rudess, Shamir, and Alderman, or is that like a different name? Yeah, it's that. Oh, wow. Hmm. Subsidiary of Dell? Yeah. EMC. EMC. Yeah. Yeah. EMC. Yeah. 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 Hmm. Um... Yeah, and so RSA is, um, controversial isn't the right word. It comes up frequently because if we are able to break RSA by being able to factor large primes, which is kind of the basis of RSA, is that very, very large prime numbers are not able to be factored. And so if that ever becomes not true, which it's ma not mathematically proven that it can't be true, um, which is to say uh, it is possible that there could eventually be technology that could factor the large primes that we often use for creating RSA keys. If that were to happen, uh, quantum computers are often part of this conversation, though I recently went to talk on quantum computers about how it's more likely that traditional computing will break RSA before quantum computing for a variety of reasons. But um, if RSA is ever broken, then that is a large basis for how we communicate across the internet, right? That's how you upload things to Git securely and how you SSH into other machines securely and et cetera. Um, so yeah, our world is built on toothpicks and <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think by definition, a prime number can't be factored, right? Uh, RSA is based on the yeah, 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 product. Yeah, two products which yeah. means large primes. Yeah, I should clarify. Yeah, so RSAs are, yeah, when you multiply two very large prime numbers, and then being able to factor that product would exactly. be the. Yeah. Sorry, I did not describe that very well. Thank you for clarifying. Um, SHA is the secure hashing algorithm. Um, <laughs> does anyone want to describe to me what hashing is? Hashing is a mathematical function <clears throat> where you can feed a value in and get a, a value out, but you can't reverse the process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <clears throat> so one key feature is that it's irreversible. Um, the other is that uh, typically all of the outputs, regardless of the size of the input, the size of the output will always be the same. Um, so hashing, like all passwords ever, hopefully, fingers crossed, are <laughs> go through a hashing algorithm um, so that they're stored in the database, not as plain text to your password, but as um, kind of gobbledygook. So if, if anyone ever tried to see your password, they would not only not have data of how long it is because all of the outputs are of the same length, regardless of the length of the input. Um, but hopefully they would also not be able to reverse the hash and determine what your password was. Um, so the secure hashing algorithm, SHA-1, I think has been broken for a long time, um, but now we're on SHA-256, question mark, is like the new one. Wow. 
Um, oh, it's not like one through two fifty six. It's like one. Two, it's like one two three two fifty six. Um, but. Um, yeah. Um, but yeah, this is uh, again like a widespread, um, like very much ingrained into how we communicate over the internet and encrypt data um, over the internet. Although it's much less breakable than RSA, I believe. So they basically just keep making newer, better hashing algorithms and hopefully can outpace the people who are breaking the older hashing algorithms. Oh, yes? It, it seems worth mentioning that you do not get forward secrecy with hashing algorithms. That if you used a weak hashing algorithm and somebody comes across the thing you hashed later, they can reverse it just fine. Yes. <clears throat> yeah, once a hashing algorithm is, quote, broken, then everything that was hashed with that algorithm can be unhashed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I thought it was a one-way algorithm, though. Say again? I thought it was a one-way algorithm. There's no one-way deal. Well, in principle. It's yeah. To be. <laughs> yeah. It's what's called a uh, hash collision, where you can take another mathematical function and derive the same hash. So if you could have two mathematical functions that spit out the same hash, you have uh, basically broken the algorithm because you can spoof now effectively what the algorithm was originally supposed to produce. Also, if you have a really bad hashing algorithm, like if your hashing algorithm is just I'm going to take all the bits and I'm going to fold them backwards, like that's yeah. not a very good hashing algorithm. People can reverse that pretty easily. Definitely. So on that, that's, that's why you, uh, you occasionally, you, you change the salting on your passwords before you hash. Yeah. Reducing the amount of time that people have to, to try and break your algorithm. Well, salting is typically used to prevent things like uh, rainbow tables from working. So the idea behind a rainbow table is that I take the 100 most common passwords and figure out what the hashes are according to SHA-1 or whatever your hashing algorithm is, and then just look for those instead of looking for the actual passwords. So the idea of a salt is that I add like some random data to people's really bad passwords, mm -hmm. and then the hashes are not the common hashes that people would use in a rainbow table. So if the hackers don't know what the salt is, then they don't know what to put into their, basically it's like giving people a actually secure password when they do not actually use secure passwords um, or generating one for them. Um, so that's the idea behind salting. But yeah, you definitely do want to salt your passwords and update those salts frequently. Um, as good security practice. Um, so that would be like what a password manager does? Or, uh, um, well, a password manager, I think, just generates like secure passwords based on the like master password that you typically have, right? And <laughs> then like securely stores that locally instead of somewhere else. I, I could be wrong, but I think <clears throat> the salt is a value that's known only to the operating system. Yeah, so yeah. It generates the hash and then adds the salt, and from there decides this person should be authenticated or not. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hopefully, like, you never know what the salt is. Um, and yeah, it just gets added to the password every time you type it in. But yeah. Um, Diffie Hellman is a secure key exchange method. So that's how, um, like, if I had a private key that I wanted to exchange with Emily then we could use the Diffie-Hellman protocol to securely exchange those keys over a public internet connection. So anyone watching would still not be able to see our private information. Um, I don't want to explain it right now, but there's a link you can click that will explain it, and it's very handy, um, mostly because I'm short on time. Okay, um, so now I want to list some common utilities. This is like t tip of the iceberg is a generous name for um, the list of utilities. Like this is really just the like day one, day two, day three utilities that you'll learn about. Um, so yeah, super basics. The must haves are man for looking up commands that you do not know. This is a super common interview question, which feels at this point like contrived slash insulting a little bit, but, um, <laughs> But uh, nonetheless, apparently some people don't know it. 
Um, so yeah, man for looking up things. LS for listing files. Whoops. Um, changing directory. Uh, reading long things in a actually readable way. Cat uh, concatenates text to your terminal. So basically printing things to your terminal. Uh, searching for things with grep. I recently learned about better greps, which uh, the one I heard about is called the Silver Searcher or Surfer. Silver yeah, AG. Um, so it's much faster than typical than like standard grep. I don't fully understand why because I just learned about it. Algorithm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, math. Um, Silver Searcher. Oh yes. The the thing that AG does that's actually more important than it being fast in, in my opinion is uh -huh. that if you use it in a revision control directory like a Git repository, it ignores everything in the dot git <gasps> directory so that you is don't magical. see all stuff twice. Oh my gosh. Speaking of that, there's also git grep which will search in history for you as well. Oh. Is silver searcher faster than git grep? I believe it is because I think git grep under the hood is just using grep. You might be able to wire up git grep to use silver searcher under the hood based on the fact that git is just a bunch of Lego stuff together into a conglomeration. <laughs> um, find is used for finding files, so it's like grep for files. Uh, Cause is a very important tool for demonstrating command line utilities. What's Cause? Oh, uh, if oh, you must demonstrate. Let me demonstrate. There we go. It's part of the BSD toys package. Oh, that's why I don't remember. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't there an option to do a task? What is the cow file? That's probably the ASCII. Oh. Yeah. Echo hello, pet cow say. That's the one, yeah. I think it's a user who will prepare cow say. You can look in there for cow file definitions. I had to compile this. I mean, I'll probably keep giving my talk instead of doing that. Talk amongst yourself. Yeah. Since you're looking at the man, man page, uh, I would suggest man space dash k, oh. because that will search within the man pages for a word. If you don't know the name of the command you're searching for, I use man space dash k a lot. Oh, and you're using it right there. Yep. Yeah. Configurable speaking thinking cow. <laughs> There's another one that I slip into one of my labs. They have to install it, but it's SL. Oh, yeah, that's a good. I actually don't think I have it installed on this well, one. What's yeah. Well, what's SL? Uh, Steam locomotive. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm on conference Wi-Fi, actually. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> One of the really irritating things about having Kause installs is if you run Ansible, it puts every single task header through Kause for the output. <laughs> Wait, why? <laughs> why not? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's opt-out as opposed to opt-in. <laughs> for, for the same reason you'd install SL to be like mean to other people on the system. And the yeah. back to Bob. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but the faster operator from hell. Yeah. Um, OK, so these are things you probably already know, but I find myself using them frequently, so in case you don't. I am also Mixer is used to like do audio stuff. Um, I often use it because for some reason I have like two, I don't even remember what this dash sheet is. I have two audio f output things, cards. Um, and I have to use the second one instead of the first one. So every time I need to like unmute things, I specify that. Can you change cards at the top? Oh. Select sound card, F6. Yeah, but it's a lot easier to just open it into the one that I want. Instead of have the HDMI sound output is card zero, the default one, yeah. for angry reasons. For reasons that make me angry. Hmm. I didn't know. Wait, so is it this way for everyone? Uh -huh. Oh my gosh, I thought it was just me. Everyone on a newish ThinkPad. <laughs> okay. If you're an oldish ThinkPad, you're safe. I see. Hmm. What's the that is angry making. Uh, it, it 
the Linux kernel loads the HDMI sound card first, yeah. and then it makes that one the default. Oh, okay. Okay. Rarely the correct answer. Yeah. Um, in evidence that I didn't give enough time for this talk, we have four minutes left, um, and probably like 16 slides. So, <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, I'm, yeah, I'm going to quickly open it to questions, and then we have a couple of options. One, I can just try to get through it as quickly as possible, <laughs> like lightning talk. Um, or we can just talk for four minutes. But does anyone have questions? We're here for you. Go for it. Cool. What, what, what does your lightning talk sound like? Let's find out. OK. <laughs> <laughs> also Mixer. Uh, does sound stuff. Tree. List files pretty. Uh, HTOP. List process is pretty. Uh, curl w get gets uh, like URLs. So like po uh, can send HTTP requests, I believe, is probably the. Uh, word count counts words. Cal is your calendar thing. This is so handy. I use this literally every day when my mom is like, can you do this thing on this day? And I don't know what day of the week that is. Um, TMX is the terminal multiplexer. Uh, so this is used if you want to like split your windows on remote systems or on your current system. But there's like other things for that, like i3, yay. Um, Xargs is used to pass arguments into the next command. So like if you're piping anything, you're probably using Xargs. And then rsync is better than SCP. Uh, controversial opinion, I know. But uh, yeah, these are used to securely copy files from one location to another remote location. Um, over SSH question mark? I know SCP is over SSH. I think rsync is as well. rsync has support for SSH argument, okay. whereas SCP uh, is part of the SSH package. Right. I know SCP runs on SSH. What is rsync? Yeah. rsync just uses SSH. Oh, okay, it cool. Just, it just pipes through SSH. Okay, that's what I thought. I just wasn't sure. Um, okay, these are some that I very occasionally use. So rtorrent is a command line torrent manager. Uh, Gparted is used for managing your partitions. So like if you want to resize your root partition or resize your boot partition, like I just did and then broke everything. I was about to say, or screw up your system. <laughs> or really screw up your system, yeah. But yeah, this I has a nice work. like GUI interface for doing it. So if you're gonna do it, like definitely I think use Gparted. Um, MDATUM is used for load balancing, no, question mark? Raid. Wow. Software raid. Raid. Yes, Software for raid. raid. Yeah. Um, so like uh, basically managing data between multiple machines and like how do you do that, which is RAID. Um, this lists your hardware. Uh, this will indent files. This was really nice when I had a professor that was very strict about how you indented your files. And you can use different standards like the IEEE whatever 3.8, well, I don't even know, <laughs> standard. Um, and it will just automatically indent whatever code you have uh, I used it for C. I don't know if it works for other languages, but it's very, very handy. Um, I completely forget what this does. Yeah, I'll just abbreviate it. Gives you information about file. <laughs> oh. It's exactly the same thing. Okay. Search manual pages. Cool. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I don't use that very often. Okay. Oh, man. I think I'm like over time now. That's a different talk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wow. Yeah, I was going to say, oh, this is this is four <laughs> minutes on its own. Uh, it's a slash bin or slash user bin. Oh, there's more. Slash bin is system binaries. Yeah. Yeah, S bin is system binaries. User is like all of the binaries that you install. Slash bin is cons what's considered essential binaries. Um, which was a weird distinction. Like when I looked in my slash bin and my slash user bin, it was like some of these to me seem very essential and some of the ones in slash bin seem very non-essential, but uh, I guess it's not up to me. We don't use like traditional system five run modes anymore. Mm. I think that's why it's a historical difference in how bin and user bin were treated. Definitely. Well, and nowadays, like pretty much everything you care about is in slash user bin, yeah. Yeah, right. We don't run what kind of system bin? Um, the, so it used to be that like the way that you could run
run your system, there was like single user mode, multi user mode, there was five different run modes that you could have on your Unix system. And uh, the reason to like split things up like that was that if you're running in the strictest, leanest run mode, you wanted to make sure that like the partition that contained the stuff you needed to boot the operating system would be where you expected it to be. Yeah. Um, I actually do want to get to like the fun stuff, which is not this, unfortunately. But quine. Quine, quines are fun. Uh, quines are programs that output themselves. <laughs> they have them in a variety of languages. I highly recommend Googling. Uh, but the fun ones are not the books. <laughs> Not the punctuation. The stuff to know. This is the fun stuff. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> um, the first one is all your base are belong to us. So this is a poor translation from Japanese to English um, from the opening scenes of a game called Zero Wing uh, where, yeah, they would say all your base are belong to us. And now that's like a thing people say. Um, usually in like a hackery, like I have stolen all of your things kind of context. Um, the Magic Switch is a wonderful story. I highly re recommend clicking on this and reading it at some point. Um, about there was a switch on a machine and it didn't. It was not hooked up to anything, and it wasn't touching anything. There was no wires coming in or out of it. And when it was on Magic, it did not work. And when it was on More Magic, it did work. <laughs> um, Hunter Two. I'm sure everyone's heard of. Uh, I don't know that we have time to click. Oh. We totally have time to click. There's, there's something wrong with your projector, Lucy. It's not supposed to show up. <laughs> um, how do I enhance? Uh, your C trolling. <laughs> hey, if you type in your password, it will show a star. Star, 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 uh -huh. C. Hunter 2. It doesn't look like stars to me. <laughs> <laughs> and then the person appears to copy paste uh, stars and said, that's what I see. And they said, oh, really? Absolutely. You can get Hunter 2, my Hunter 2, my Hunter 2. <laughs> Does that look funny to you? And then eventually they reveal that they know that their password is Hunter 2. Mm -hmm. And now every time someone needs a fake password, they use Hunter 2. Mm -hmm. um, Hackers is a wonderful movie, um, definitely part of like the tech culture zeitgeist. Um, Oh, and this was a great quote that I read while researching this talk. It said, should have been titled Crackers because cracking is what the movie is about. It's understandable that they didn't, however. Titles redolent of snack foods are probably a top sell in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. I found that quote very amusing. Mm -hmm. um, this is a wonderful Stack Overflow post. Uh, I'm like so far over time. Um, the evil bit. I also have the pigeon. Uh, <laughs> Our pigeon protocol. Uh, obfuscated C contest. Yeah, our, this is the pigeon protocol. Um, protocol. Do we want to like recite the Konami code together? <laughs> <laughs> That'll be our final like chant as we leave. Okay, ready? Up, up, down, down, left, right, the left, right, A, B, start. <laughs> Yay. Okay, thank you. <laughs> cool. Here's some resources. Thanks for bearing with me. Um, yeah. One person left early and the rest of us stayed late. Yay! Yeah, thank you. Thank you for staying late. They two after that person left. Yeah. <laughs> so they left with two more kids. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah.